الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I think we have covered the things that nullifies one's fasting and uh, we have talked about it uh, الحمد لله and these things the seven things the consensus of scholars, they have all agreed upon them. Yet there are things that are a matter of differing between scholars. They differ whether they nullify fasting or not. For example, the eyeliner, or what we call in Arabic, kuhul. It's something that a person puts on his eyes. It makes it a little bit darker. It gives the eyes a form of beauty. In the early age of, of, of Islam, Arabs and Muslims used to do this, males and females. It's not something that is only for females. It is something that we were asked to do, males also, because it clears the vision and it gives power to the person and it's a healthy thing to put on your eyes. Nowadays, men maybe uh, don't do this anymore but if they do it, we should not be uh, surprised when we see someone having it. I'm talking about the eyeliners. I'm not co talking about eyelashes and, and, and mascara and putting makeup. You don't expect a person, a, a man, to put this th these things on. But the eyeliners itself, using a certain substance that is called kuhul, which is made from a certain type of stone which is crushed until it is uh, applicable to, to the eyes. This, some scholars say that it nullifies your fasting. Also, they say that if you put or use an eye drop, if you use an ear drop, and you find the taste of it in your throat, then this also nullifies your fasting. It's a matter of dispute among scholars. But the most authentic uh, verdict on this subject is that it doesn't. See, you don't break your fast by finding the taste of something in your throat. Some scholars go a little bit further. They say that if you put some uh, cream, some medicine on your foot, and you find the taste in your throat, man, your, th your, your foot is so close to your throat. That this, is, this is way off. But they say, it's mentioned in the books, maybe you won't be able to uh, imagine this, but they've mentioned it in their books. So hypothetically, let's, uh, let's assume that a person does find the taste of it in his throat. That does not nullify your fast. Why? Because the foot is not a normal passage to your stomach. Your ear, your eye is not a normal passage to your stomach. That is why whatever you use, ear drops, eye drops, does not nullify your fasting. Now, there is an exception. If you use nose drops, then in this case, no, this nullifies your fasting. Why is that? Because the, the nose is a normal passage to the stomach. And that, that is why if you inhale some water, it goes to your stomach. And that is why the Prophet وسلم, in the hadith of Laqit ibn Subra, Sabura, he told him that do a, a sniff water and get water to the top of your nostrils as far as you can get while performing wudu unless you are fasting. He told him, if you're fasting, don't do that. Don't inhale that water uh, to the uh, top of your nostrils because then there's a possibility that water goes in to your stomach and you will uh, uh, avoid your fasting uh, through this process. So from here, we understand that these things 
do not nullify your fasting. Ear drops, uh, eye drops, eye lining, this is all permissible uh, during the fasting. One of the brothers was asking me about makeup. If uh, women put uh, makeup on, if they wear their makeup during uh, the month of Ramadan, this is normal thing, though I have my own personal, that is, personal reasons uh, uh, not to like makeup. See, a woman is beautiful the way that Allah has created her. She does not need things from outside to make her more beautiful. Maybe she needs a touch or two. See, eyelining is uh, something that is natural. Uh, all the people uh, do that. So uh, women are asked to do that. They're asked to wear gold and jewelry, to, to dress nicely. But the way that the, the women nowadays are uh, diverting from this natural thing into this uh, unnatural thing, the, 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 the tons and loads of makeup they put on their faces, you end up with creatures from outer space. See, I, in Islam, and, 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 and this is something for men and for women, and we, we, we give this free advice uh, to them all. It, it is Islamic not to grow your fingernails. And, and this is weird because fingernails, if you grow it, 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 it compiles, it gathers uh, dirt and, and microbes and, and all of the filthy things. So Islam tells you, wait, don't do that. You have to chop it all off. You have to trim your fingernails and cut it. Yet people, even males, you, you, you find men with a fingernail this, this long and only one finger. And what is it used for? Maybe for you know, helping the missus with, with the vegetables and, and uh, with, with the squash, you know, to, to dig it in and, and fix it. It's used for um, scratching their, their, their head. And it's very awkward. Even if someone, someone shakes hands with you, it is like, you know, a stranger from outer space does this to you because he doesn't want to affect his fingernail. Now, in men, it's not acceptable at all. In women, a lot of Muslims tend to think that this is signs of beauty. So you end up with women with like this long fingernails uh, as if they're animals, you know, uh, predators ready to jump and, 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 and eat you alive. And they're, they're, they're men eaters. And uh, adding to that, they polish their nails with red, signs of blood. So they have already uh, got their, their, their uh, prey and they have already uh, had their meal. And they think that this is a sign of beauty. In Islam, it is forbidden for a Muslim, male or female, to grow their fingernails. It is signs of nature. The Prophet ﷺ told us that there are 10 signs of nature. Of, it's natural. And part of it, one of it, is chopping off or cutting or trimming uh, uh, the nails. So it is not permissible. Yet, a lot of the women do it. And a lot of the women put loads and loads of makeup on their faces. You know, they put these purple colors, uh, pink colors, dark colors. They put this uh, red thing on their chins. They put uh, uh, the powder. And they have a long process, like an hour or two, just to wear their makeup. And if they're going to a wedding or a party, they would probably spend uh, a, a fortune. They would spend a lot of money just to wear this makeup and to have their hair style. Is it haram? I said it is a personal uh, reasons. I've got my own personal reasons not to like this. I think that a, a woman is as beautiful as she could be being natural, being herself. But if a woman tries to imitate, to copy this model or that, she would not be herself. And the minute I look at her, I would not look at this particular Muslim woman. I'm going to look at the differences between her and that model she's trying to imitate and copy. And I would definitely not like her. I would like the other one because that, uh, the other one is more perfect than this one. But if she is natural and if, if the beauty comes within from her Islam, from her kindness, from her uh, being good and close to her husband, then she is the most beautiful woman on earth in my sight. And this is the one I love. 
not the one that's trying to go out of her way to look like someone else. Nevertheless, again, nevertheless, makeup does not uh, uh, nullify your fasting. If a woman wears makeup, it's okay. It, it has nothing to do with eating, drinking, and the things that nullifies uh, fasting. Uh, also, uh, a lot of, 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 of the uh, brothers uh, have dis uh, uh, different opinions. A lot of the scholars have different opinions uh, concerning cupping. And what is cupping? Cupping, it's uh, something that comes from uh, Arabia, and I think it's practiced elsewhere. It is a very healthy uh, thing to do, though it sounds a little bit awkward and weird to those who don't know it. Cupping is slashing, is making small wounds at the back of the neck, at the bottom of the head, or at the back or at the shoulders. And then the blood which is clustered, the blood that is uh, dark in color, it's different than the, the blood that comes out out of, out of a wound or, or from the, your normal veins. We think that it is clustered there and it is, it's not moving. So the minute you suck it out, this amount of blood, it's, it's, it's not, a, you don't suck it out, it's, it's, don't be confused with it, you just suck it out, it's a small amount of it. This has a very healthy uh, consequences. It helps your vision, it helps your memory. You don't do this often, you do it like once or twice a year, but you have to do it according to the sunnah. There are special days concerning with the lunar uh, month, you have to uh, pay attention to uh, special days during the week. There are days you're not supposed to do it. There are a few things that govern this, uh, this matter. Now, there are two hadiths that uh, talk about this subject. And this is why scholars differ concerning cupping. Is cupping uh, one of the nullifications of fasting or not? The first hadith is narrated by Shaddad, by Shaddad ibn Aus. May Allah be pleased with him. He said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the one who cups and the one who is cupped. See, you need two persons. One to uh, a, a person that does the cupping and one who is the patient, who is being cupped. So the one who cups and the one who is cupped have broken their fast. This hadith is authentic. And the Prophet says he has both of them have broken their fast, then it's, it's nullified. Yet there is another hadith narrated by Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and with his father. His name is Abdullah Ibn Abbas. So usually they uh, uh, neglect the first name and would say Ibn Abbas, the son of Abbas. And Abdullah is the cousin, Abbas is the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that the Prophet, may Allah uh, uh, peace and uh, praise be upon him, had himself cupped when he was wearing the ihram. The ihram is the, the cloth you, you wear when you perform umrah or when you perform pilgrimage, hajj. So it's, it's, it's usually a, a white uh, upper uh, cloth for the upper body and uh, something that you wear around your waist, it's also white. So while he was performing hajj, he, the Prophet, had himself cupped while he was wearing the ihram during Hajj and Umrah, and also when he was fasting. Now, we have two, again, contradicting evidences, as we mentioned before. And this one, this hadith, is narrated by Bukhari. And the other one was narrated in, an, in el elsewhere. It was not narrated by the Bukhari. So it's a lower grade. And this one tells us that the Prophet did it while in the form of ihram. It does not tell us that it was on the last pilgrimage that the Prophet ﷺ did. So we cannot know the time. But scholars say they, they differ. Some of them took the first hadith and said, okay, it, they have nullified their prayer. They have broken, uh, sorry, they have nullified their fast. They have broken their fast. Those who cup and those who are being cupped. And other scholars said, no. We will stick with the other hadith, the second hadith, which tells us that the Prophet cupped him, had himself cupped when he was wearing the ihram and when he was fasting. Because of this difference among scholars, it is safer not to cup. And I am telling this knowing that 
90% of the people do not cup. And maybe 80% of the people do not know cupping to start with. But nevertheless, you have all the time you want at nighttime. So delay this until it is nighttime and do it uh, at nighttime just to be on the safe side. And this brings us to another thing, which is normal bleeding. If somebody is wounded and he's bleeding, does this uh, nullify his, his fast? Well, if somebody is nose bleeding, a lot of people, uh, when they're uh, uh, exposed to sun or heat, they would pro probably uh, bleed from their noses. And if I go to a hospital and the doctor says, I need a, a sample of your blood, and they take a sample of my blood, does this nullify fasting? Scholars say, no, it does not. Except, and unless it affects your health. So if you're donating blood, and the guy takes like a, a, a quarter of a liter or, or less, that's not, that, uh, it's not significant. If he takes a small portion of your blood as a blood sample, if you bleed uh, lightly, it's okay. But if you have a hemorrhage, if you're ble bleeding real bad, or if the guy takes a whole liter of you because you have to donate uh, blood to someone who uh, is in a critical condition, then scholars say, no, there's, a ha there's hazardous, it's, it is hazardous, there's hazard on your health and life. Then you have to break your fast. This nullifies your uh, fasting. And uh, there is something else, but I think uh, there is no time for that. Uh, I see that a lot of the brothers have questions, so we may uh, switch into the Q&A. So does anybody have a, a question? Yes, sir. In the case of... Um like let's say you have you have one of these reasons that you notify your fast, okay, and especially in the case where you have like excessive bleeding or you have to break your fast because of bleeding, do you have to compensate for this mm -hmm. on other days? Like do you have to fast other days for it? Yes, you, you do have to compensate, of course. If you nullify your fast, whether because of a legitimate reason or if you do it intentionally without a legitimate reason, Definitely, you have to uh, uh, compensate, you have to make up for that day. But there is a difference that if, you, if your re reasons are legitimate, then you, you're not sinful. As if you're traveling, if I'm traveling, if, I, if, I, if I'm ill, and I have to uh, nullify my, my fasting because of this legitimate excuse, you make up for that, but you uh, are not sinful for doing this. If you break your fast simply because you don't feel like fasting, you're, you are sinful and still you have to make up for that day that you did not fast. And uh, uh, the question is, do I have to pay anything? Do I have to feed anybody for doing this? It's a matter of uh, different opinion among scholars. Again, some of them say, as long as you make it up before the following Ramadan comes, you're in the clear. All what you have to do is make up for that day. But if the second Ramadan comes and you don't make up, after the second Ramadan is over, you make up for that day and you feed one poor person. But the most authentic opinion of all scholars, that, of, of the scholars, that it is not a must that you pay. If you skip a day legitimately or illegitimately, you don't feed. You just make up for that day. If you want to vol volunteer and, and feed a person alongside with making up that day, that's good, that's great. Whatever good you make, alhamdulillah, it is accepted by Allah, but it is not a must for you to feed when making up for that day. Second question, please. Yes, sir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, if someone skipped some days in Ramadan and he wants to make up uh, on another month, would you do it consecutively on consecutive days, or uh, is there a pattern for it? Or something? Well, uh, uh, it is not. The, the, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal has uh, mentioned in the Holy Quran, فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَامٍ أُخَرٍ That if you break the fast due to traveling or due to illness, then you should make up for these days later on. He did not say you have to have it consecutively. You don't have to have it uh, uh, all uh, f one day following the other. You can fast one day here, two days after a week, three days after like two, three months. Alhamdulillah, you can do that. But the question 
that may arise is, must I do it immediately, or do I have uh, the time and chance to delay it a little bit? Uh, Mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, and by the way, she is uh, uh, the youngest wife of the Prophet ﷺ. She is the daughter of Abu Bakr, uh, uh, the first caliph, uh, caliph of, of Islam, and she is the uh, most uh, female that narrated hadiths uh, uh, from the Prophet ﷺ. She said that she used to uh, uh, break the fast during the holy month of Ramadan due to her monthly period. And she would not make up for these days until Sha'ban comes, which is the month before the following Ramadan, due to uh, uh, her position from the Prophet ﷺ. Meaning that she does not want during the whole year when the Prophet comes in the morning, maybe he wants, uh, he wants her, he loves her, maybe he would like to have intercourse with her. That's why she does not fast until it is really deadline at the month of Sha'ban, and she delays uh, uh, making up for the days she did not fast during the first Ramadan until the second Ramadan is inevitable, it's going to come, then she is forced to fast it. So this gives us an idea that it is permissible for a person to make up for the days of Ramadan whenever he wants during the whole year. It's, it's, it is no problem. He does it in the very beginning or he does it at the very end, providing that the, 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 the next Ramadan did not come. Uh, this is all the time we have for today's session. Uh, inshallah, until we meet next time, fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.